man. But I thought before we did that, per, um, perhaps we could talk a little bit about some of the early influences. Um, perhaps start with what it was like to be a young gay Catholic in Vicksburg, Mississippi. Uh, and what were some of your early influences, films and plays, etc.? I don't know how far I, I don't think be. you're fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, it, it, uh, it wasn't any fun. You <laughs> <laughs> said it was like a Eugene O'Neill play. Um, yeah, I, I, I really had to get out of there. I always knew that. Um, in fact, I fairly much ran away from home uh, once. <clears throat> but uh, my father caught up with me uh, and uh, sort of made a deal with me. I mean, uh, I, I went to California, of course, because I thought I was going to... Uh, not get in the movies uh, to be an actor, but that I would work for a studio, God knows doing what. Um, I, I was only 17, I think. Um, so he was about he to have a private detective try to find me. Um, when I answered some desperate messages from him, and he agreed to uh, meet me in Chicago. So I took a Greyhound bus, I think, cross country from LA to Chicago to meet my father. It was 1952. And um, uh, he had wanted me to go to Notre Dame. And I had said, well, you know, I'm just not a football player, uh, <laughs> to say the least. Um, and he said, I, he said, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I want to go to film school at, at UCLA. And he's, he was a rather Catholic. So he said, oh, my God, a non-Catholic school? Never. Uh, if you can find a Catholic school that has a drama department or a film department, um, then you could go to that. So I set about reading uh, and doing research uh, I might add that while we were in Chicago, I saw new faces at 52. <laughs> Which, um, and who were some of the new faces? Do you remember? Paul Lynn. Oh, yeah. uh, Alice Ghostly. Oh, uh, oh, who else was in that show? Howard Manilow, oh, certainly knows. Hmm. Not C.C. Jones. No, no, that was 57. Um, I don't know. Uh, Brenda Kidd. Arthur Kidd, yeah, she had a big show stocking number of uh, monotonous. Anyway, that's beside the point. The other show that I saw, uh, which my father thought was much too risque for me, but uh, um, I didn't, was uh, uh, the revival of um, Pal Joy with Vivian Siegel, and, uh, who was in the original. And... Um, Christ, I can't. Harold Lang? Harold Lang, but Elaine Stritch. Elaine Stritch. was in oh, and nice. doing Zip. So, oh God, that was the greatest. Um, so, running away and getting to Chicago and uh, seeing the shows and then reading about this place called the Catholic University of America. Uh, nobody ever gets that right. They think, what Catholic University? <laughs> and uh, it's in Washington, D.C., and in the 50s and the 40s, it had a great, great reputation for the drama department because they had fabulous teachers uh, and uh, graduates who went on to make good in the theater. Uh, Walter Kerr, who later was a New York Times drama critic, as you know, was one of the teachers. His wife, uh, or later to become his wife, Jean Kerr, was another teacher. And uh, the man who directed the uh, original production of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf on Broadway, a uh, wonderful uh, director who was run over by a taxi in London and killed because he looked the wrong way. Oh. Uh, Alan Schneider, who was the original uh, director of Virginia Woolf, he was one of the teachers too. So uh, I had great exposure, uh, and the uh, university, well, the drama department, had two summer stock uh, theaters, and 
I never wanted to go back to Mississippi as long as I lived, but uh, so I, I really dreamt up things to uh, take up my time in the summer. And uh, if I could have got out of Christmas vacation, I would have done so. <laughs> However, one Christmas vacation changed my life. Uh, uh, and that was the summer, I mean, that was the Christmas of 1954, I think. Uh, I was dreading going home, and I had to. And uh, I didn't know what the hell I was going to do for 10 days. And uh, somebody who knew me said, well, you know, they're, they're making a movie up the road from here. And I said, really? What is it? And, and they said, well, it's uh, something that Tennessee Williams wrote. It's called Baby Doll. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's got no stars in it. Uh, and we, I don't know anything more about it. So I, I got in the car and drove. And uh, the sheriff uh, in Benoit, Mississippi, where the old falling down mansion that they were shooting in uh, was, uh, had the place all roped off. They didn't have yellow tape in those days. It was roped. I suppose that was to lynch you in case oh, you, <laughs> you broke the law. Um, but anyway, uh, I retreated to a, a, a dump of a road roadhouse called Doe's Eat Place. Doe for Dominic, a Sicilian who ran it, and it really was Kazan's kind of joint, I lived to find out, I mean, uh, and, um, and actually it was Bill Clinton's kind of joint too, because he used to, uh, the, the airport in Greenville, where it was, is still there, uh, it was always filled with private planes, uh, all these uh, rich, planters and so forth from around Arkansas, Louisiana, fly to Greenville just to um, eat all of the stuff they have. And they only have about six things on the menu, uh, which is spaghetti <laughs> and uh, steak and uh, oysters that are shucked right out of the barrels of ice right there in front of you. And it's in an old dilapidated house in the black section of town. It was so bizarre. Mississippi was so bizarre. Because it was, um, it really was a grocery store that was run by a white family. And they catered only to black people. So the blacks came in the front door. But the whites had to go around to the back door to get in to the restaurant part. Uh, which was a restaurant. It was just a room with a lot of uh, naked light bulbs and it looked like Kazan's set, you know, uh, and some stoves that they cooked off of. And the whole Italian family, all of them at that time, uh, were waitresses and boys. Like, and they were all cooking right there and it was hot as hell, but it didn't matter. It, it had a fantastic atmosphere. So I, I heard that they went there every night. There was no place else to go. But I'm talking about the crew of Baby All. So I went over there and positioned myself to uh, a cloth Kazan, which I did. Um, eventually, he, he, he wrote out a pass for me on a, on a paper napkin that he pulled out of a dispenser and said, let the sky in or something. I never kept it. I wish I had. Um, and then I spent the next 10 days with Ilya Kazan, and I, I never left his side. I don't know why he uh, tolerated me. I was just the most uh, ambitious, irritating, annoying teenager that I had just seen Kevin on Hot Tin and Louis on Broadway. And I, I didn't want to talk about anything but Cat and, and Streetcar and... Uh, and though Carl Malden and Carol Baker were shooting in the, sw the swing sequence right, and uh, Eli Wallach right, you know, ten feet away, I didn't give a damn about them. Uh, I just wanted to latch on to Kazan. 
And finally, and I made friends with everybody on the crew, which all came in very handy in my life later because some of them worked on the film with boys. Uh, anyhow, uh, particularly the script girl, and she had been on, on the waterfront with Kazan and uh, one of the makeup men who uh, was a straight makeup man, and he was the uh, brother-in-law of Hope Lang, the actress. <laughs> And uh, so they remained lifelong friends. And uh, by the end of, of that Christmas there, uh, they were supposed to be shooting hot, sultry, southern weather with the sweat. Well, you know, it was freezing in December. <laughs> yeah. the, the set decorators had to pin uh, moss on the trees, <laughs> <laughs> magnolia, whatever. And, there were nothing but naked branches. And Carol Baker was freezing in a, in a kind of sundress that was all bare. And yet they'd come in and squirt her with a lot of spray so it looked like sweat coming down. It was hilarious. But anyway, it was the art of make believe making movies. And the only other thing I can tell you about Mississippi was that. Uh, 1948, uh, there came a picture to uh, our local theater, which was such a disaster that nobody went to it except one person. <laughs> <laughs> and I, it was in the blazing heat of the summer, and I didn't wear anything except short pants, and I went around barefoot, and uh, I actually had no kind of shirt on, unless it was a, a, a what looks like a tank top now, which was an undershirt then. Um, and I went to see it by myself. And uh, I passed a florist on the way. I don't know why, I looked in the garbage can. disaster of an Alfred Hitchcock film called Rope. <laughs> and um, it changed. And everybody always thinks that boys is so influenced by Virginia Woolf. I mean, there's only that one thing about in Virginia Woolf, it's Hump the Host is playing a game. And at some point in the script, I got stuck and thought, what are these guys going to do now? So I thought, well, a party. <laughs> and I made up the, the game that they played. But other than that, and the, and the vicious, bitchy dialogue, uh, I can't see too much resemblance myself. However, it, Rope has an enormous influence on the picture and on the play. Uh, it was about, it was a coded picture about uh, the Leopold Lowe murder case. Uh, Hitchcock was clever enough to have gay actors play the parts, although they were straight in the movie, mm -hmm. but they were played by you know, John Dahl and Farley Granger. And uh, I, uh, I picked up on it all. <laughs> I was the only person in this theater, this 13-year-old boy, sniffing a red rose. <laughs> it was pretty bizarre, and it was pretty southern. I mean, it's like a Carson McCullers. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, it just never left me. And I think that it, it, it has more influence on the play than anything, including Virginia Woolf. Virginia Woolf just uh, it 
because of all of the interweaving of all the having a lot having everything to do with it getting done in the workshop and then later deciding that you despise the play. Uh, that Edward Albee despised. He, oh yeah, 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 yeah. I mean he says that in uh, one of those documentaries you got there. I mean the documentary that you got there made before. He talks about it being so detrimental to a burgeoning uh, gay awareness. Mm -hmm. What burgeoning gay awareness? There was no such thing in 1967. So yeah, really. Well, and of course Natalie Wood played a huge part in um, actually seeing um, uh, Boys in the Band getting written. Yeah, uh, she was a great friend of mine. I met her on... Oh, by the way, <coughs> just to make it quick, Sorry I bore you to death, lady. <laughs> anyway, um, that's not the first person. <laughs> Actually, when Boys opened, it was so it was the theater was so empty that Bob Moore, the director, and I were is sitting on the backs of the theater chairs with our feet on the seats. And we saw a lady who looked just like that <laughs> get up from back. And I said to him, oh, well, there goes the first one. <laughs> and lo and behold, she moved down to an empty seat in the front row. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, you're getting back to something good. Uh, uh, Natalie Wood. Yeah. Actually, I had a question about Natalie Wood. Uh, you said, and I also read it, that she had a kindness test. Uh, oh, that oh. she wanted uh, people who were kind surrounding her. I'm just wondering what an example of a kindness test for Natalie Wood might be. Well, gee, I don't know what it was. I really don't know what the hell that. So you just passed her without even knowing that you were. Well, mm -hmm. there were four of us. There were two guys. I mean, there was my great friend, Howard Jeffrey, who was Jerry Robbins' assistant and on whom Harold is based. And um, then there was an actress who was Natalie's best friend called Norma Crane. And uh, though she worked in New York and theater and Broadway and off-Broadway, you would know her uh, mm -hmm. from her final film appearance as Golda in the uh, film version of uh, Fiddler on the Roof. And it was so tragic because I was with her in London while she was shooting that in Dubrovnik and she was coming back and forth. But there was a long sequ sequence when she, I was staying in her apartment in London, the rented apartment, and she, um, she got discovered a lump in her breast uh, while shooting in Dubrovnik and she was terrified that uh, they would replace her. So she kept putting off having a mammography and all of that and not telling anybody. And by the time she got back to London and did go through with that, it was too late. And um, she eventually died of breast cancer in a, in a year's time. Uh, but anyway, I go back to uh, Natalie. Natalie Wood and actually the writing of Oh no 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 it was, it was well, the nucleus. Yeah. yeah, it was Howard and me and Norma and Natalie. And we were called Bubble Bubble Doctor Trouble. <laughs> <laughs> was I was trouble. <laughs> <laughs> the two girls were bubbles uh -huh. and Howard was toil. And all he did was slave for Jerry Robbins. <laughs> Uh, so do you want to say a little bit about the writing of Boys in the Band? I know that you were able to write it um, in a mansion in <laughs> yeah. Hollywood. Yeah, it, it, uh, like all of my life, it's been pretty improbable. Um, uh, I was totally broke, and this was after having had some success in Hollywood, having had 20th Century Fox buy a screenplay, that was meant for now. I wrote it for Natalie, and she she was going to do it, but Daryl Lanick hated it and pulled the plug on it 
two weeks before it was to start shooting. And um, then I wrote a pilot, I mean, I, I cleaned up and uh, rewrote a pilot for Betty Davis, uh, which was shot, but never <coughs> shown, or, uh, and certainly never picked up by Quaker Oats, who, who was the sponsor, because Davis was uh, <laughs> still working on Warner Brothers time, not television time, you know, and to get her out of the trailer and in front of the camera was uh, quite a bit of doing. And um, she came out when she was ready. Um, and uh, Elizabeth Taylor had that problem too. I also worked with her on a television movie. And I was also a production assistant on Butterfield A too, so. I don't know why your film guy didn't show some of those pictures. <laughs> anyway, uh, it doesn't matter. You did a great job. <laughs> Most of those things were hang, hanging on the wall in a, in a room, so he had to shoot through glass to even get a good picture. It yeah, Kelly job. went in with a camera and shot uh, the archive that's uh, just on the walls and uh, incredible images throughout your apartment. Yeah. Well, it's only, it's behind the door, uh, <laughs> kind of hallway. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, it, it, it's not advertised when you come in the place. Yeah. Right. And actually one of my favorites, and I don't think we got a photo of that, uh, you have a page from the script of A Star is Born. Yeah, um, the original script that Garland and um, James Mason did. Uh, People have always thought that The Boys in the Band, the title, came from that movie because right before she goes, after he wipes off all that makeup that she's been sitting in the chair for five hours getting transformed into somebody else, with, uh, he wipes it off and says, just be yourself. Uh, there, she says, God, I'm scared to death. I think it's Norman, I've got the willies. I, couldn't sing a note, and he says, "Listen, uh, we're we're all terrified. Uh, just go out there." And uh, he'd seen her, as you probably know if you've seen the film. Uh, just be herself at three o'clock in the morning in a in a club where she's just kind of. Uh, whatever that's called, knocking around with the jazz musicians. She happens to be singing a great Harold Arlen song called The Man Who Got Away, but uh, uh, he says, just go out there and be yourself, and you're singing for yourself and the boys in the band. Mm -hmm. So that's, Moss Hart wrote that in, in a paragraph, and somebody gave me the script, and um, I didn't want the script, uh, but I wanted that page, even though that's not where uh, the title came from. But it just become so uh, taken for granted that that's where it came from, that I thought, why not? I mean, I've got an original page, which says, by the way, retake, <laughs> written all over it in red crayon, because they had to do it over. Um, so, I mean, I framed that, that page. And I, I sent the, uh, the original Star is Born um, <coughs> script to uh, a dealer. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, a dealer and uh, sold the uh, script. Somebody was very glad to get it. Without one page? No, I was kind enough to go get some blue paper, oh, okay. which it was revised. And um, I don't know what we did in those days. How copying was done, but I put I his page 54 back in the script. I thought they'll never know. <laughs> well, since we've segued into um, boys, um, it is pretty remarkable that this got produced, and um, it was a sensation. We could talk about how it was received in a moment. I am curious about the rehearsals. Um, um, I had heard that Cliff Gorman had come in with a 
um, particular performance and um, that it was considered too broad? Oh, well, that was in the auditions uh, uh, part of it. Because we did this play it first in a workshop, in a, a workshop that was, uh, that actually Richard Barr, who was a very important Broadway producer, who produced all of Edward Albee's plays, uh, and Edward Albee, and Barr's partner, Clinton Wilder, they took the proceeds from uh, Virginia Woolf, or some of them, uh, and did a good thing. They, they uh, did a, a writer's workshop downtown on Van Damme Street, and they really only, uh, they, they had all, every top flight writer that was around in those days submitting scripts to them, and uh, there was never a slot where you could get in or anything. Uh, and the writers were people like Sam Shepard and John Ware and Terrence McNally and, oh God, just on and on and on. And um, so, when, uh, when the agent that Natalie's fiance sent me to was uh, reluctant to send the play out because she was so shocked by it, um, I said, uh, again, emotionally falling apart like I did earlier, my God, you know, do you know Richard Barr? And she said, of course I know Richard Barr. Well, why do you ask? And I said, well, anybody who had the guts to do Virginia Woolf wouldn't blink at the script. Why don't you send it to him? And so she messengered the script to him that night. And the next morning at 10 o'clock, I got a call. I was sleeping on the couch at a friend's. And he came in and said, there's some woman on the phone that wants you. And I went. And she said, I can't believe this. Uh, Richard apparently got the script last night, read it. And uh, can you have a drink with him and Edward Albee at 5 o'clock? <laughs> <laughs> so I did. And I went there. I went to Barr's apartment. And Albee was there. He never said a word to me. Um, I, he probably shook hands, but he never said anything. And Barr did all the talking and said, you know, well, we don't know about this and whether it'll work or not, but we would like to do it in our workshop. And we have no slot for it. This was in October of 67. And he said, the first opening available time we've got is January of 68. But, and that was uh, for five performances only because uh, the actors weren't paid. And that was all equity would allow them to do. But jumping ahead, it was such a, a phenomenon overnight that um, people were wrapped around the block to see it, and there were, it was no charge at all. And um, all these celebrities were calling to try to get seats reserved for them. And um, so Equity finally gave in and let us do nine performances. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty clear at that point that it, the play was a hit. And uh, Barr was going to take it uptown. Then there was a lot of uh, uptown where? Broadway, off-Broadway. You know, they didn't think the traffic would let it, would bear it on Broadway. And I, <coughs> I agree. And uh, so found a wonderful space for it on West 55th Street. And, um, Theater 4. Yeah, it was called Theater 4. I don't know if it's still there. I think it is. The women's uh, project was there for a while. It's, uh, I don't think it's called Theater 4 anyway. It was a church. And um, after we were there, the, the <coughs> was something called the Negro Ensemble right. company had it for years. Mm -hmm. And um, so forth. Mm -hmm. um, and of course it was, as you said, a huge sensation, ran over a thousand performances, a thousand and one performances. Um, I'm interested in the response that it had gotten. I, uh, the critics generally uh, praised it. Clive Barnes went back three or four times to see it. Um, one of the th things that I found interesting, there was a piece that Rex Reed had written about it, and there were responses from um, people uh, who called it plain filth. <laughs> and another well, one said, um, 
that she uh, thought that a little more mockery and derision might help a lot toward turning some of the homosexuals back to normal channels. Uh, so I'm wondering if there was any kind of backlash. Was there any kind of homophobia? Uh, oh yeah, the there, was, there was all that. Sure. <coughs> directed at you personally? I think directed at everybody. The actors had a hell of a time. Mm -hmm. e even, even being in the show, I mean, mm -hmm. the agents didn't want them to do it mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and people pulled out. You were asking about the casting. Mm -hmm. uh, Cliff Gorman, who played Emery, was the second choice uh, because, well, not because his agent didn't want him to do it, but Bill Hickey was originally cast. And we only had uh, a week to get it up uh, on the stage at the Theater 4. And um, he didn't show up for the first day's rehearsal. And Moore said, well, we can get through it today without him. And then when he didn't come the next day, Moore said, no, 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 we've got to replace him. We've only got five days now to get it up. So um, he said, look down the list and see who that guy was who came in and did that nightclub stand-up act that was so big. He said, I could never in five days get somebody up into the park, but I can certainly tone them down. <laughs> <laughs> the producers is often credited as introducing the premium pricing, but actually Boys in the Band got a jump on that because it was such a hot ticket, uh, it was doing so well on the black market, Richard Barr raised the first seven rows to ten dollars, mm -hmm. an unheard of price. Uh, yeah, that was unheard of. Yeah, their other seats were four ninety five and uh, five ninety five. Yeah, there's quite a bit of resentment about that too. I mean, not everybody thought we were taking advantage of it. And anyway, it was just part of the time. Um, we talked about responses. One of the things that I had come across that I just found um, really interesting. There was a production in. 1973, a community theater production in Yorktown Heights. I, yeah, yeah, I read all about that. I never went to see theater. it. All but straight men. 
all straight men and uh, they were firemen and they were lawyers and they didn't know each other or right. whatever. But on why they ever decided <laughs> to get together and do play, yeah. I don't know. And they had an encounter session. Yeah. And one of the actors yeah. said that the play gave him a new understanding of homosexuality and its root causes. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things, of course, when we talk about Boys in the Band is the reaction. Now, when it opened in 1968, it was called groundbreaking and revolutionary, and then the Stonewall riots occur, and um, the play is reviled in some circles, and then in the 90s, Ben Brantley writes that it's okay to like Boys in the Band again. Uh, so I'm wondering if you could comment first on your own feelings about this play. Have they changed? Uh, how would you characterize no, the society's change? No, my feelings about the play have not changed. Uh, you know, I guess I'm still stuck in the 60s with it, and always will be. I mean, it just seemed to be, ever since I saw uh, Rope come on the screen, you know. If you go to see Rope, you, uh, I think you'll see some similarities. I mean, they're 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 odd, they're vague, they're uh, but uh, you know, they get drunk at a party, and they turn vicious, they even murder somebody, which probably brought about this vicious game and. Uh, Donald even has a line somewhere in the play about you all. Oh, they suggested they play. They were thinking of games to play, and they say, "Why don't we play murder?" <laughs> and then um, Donald says something about, "Oh yeah, we all know that one. Michael knows that one best because you kill somebody in that." And um, of course, in, in *Rope*, they actually do kill somebody uh, and put them in a chest and then serve dinner off the chest. Yeah. Yeah, and also that film is um, pretty much in real time. Just oh yeah, yeah, that's another thing. But although <coughs> having gone to drama school and having all, uh, you know, we're, we're having all been taught about, uh, well, the Greeks and so forth, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I uh, I was uh, I was always kind of uh, in love with um, you know the unities of time, place, and action to start with. But rope has that. I mean, it uh, is continuous in time. That was one of the things that Hitchcock wanted to do was just make a movie that started unreal and. and uh, finished in real time. Mm -hmm. Of course, he had the challenge of how to get from real to real, which was, you know, I think they were 20 minutes long. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I didn't have that problem. <laughs> <laughs> it just kept rolling, yeah. Now, in terms of the film version, I know that you were uh, rather insistent that this cast, and you had also hoped that uh, Robert Moore would also direct the film. Uh, was there talk about particular Hollywood stars that they had in Well, mind? you know how that goes. Um, in fact, it's going on right now in my life, another way I'll tell you. But yeah, when important producers uh, showed up to uh, want the rights and want to make a movie of it, that he had a studio attached or whatever, uh, they would throw around names all